this year our theme has been, uh, or our vision has been finishing. And Psalm 57 7 tells us that David, when things were going on in his life, he said this statement My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. Uh, what he was saying is simply this, and, and this is kind of a, a staple verse for us, is that when you settle it in your heart, whatever comes to pass, it's going to be okay because your heart's already settled on what God has for your life. And so reality says if we don't finish some things in our heart, then the enemy can run amok in our hearts. If we don't allow God to take lead in those areas, then the enemy will take the lead in those areas. So what we have to do is be cautious, but when we know that you know, people like to say, well, when it's the time of decision, the time of decision was not on the cross of Calvary. The time of decision was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he ever went to the cross. Scripture tells us that there was so much fear that he sweated as great drops of blood. But he said, Father, not my will, but your will. And when you get to the place where you literally have it settled in your heart, the enemy's not going to change it. Now, I say that in a serious matter, but let me throw you out a jokey matter about that truth. How many have ever tried to lose weight and couldn't? But then when you get to a place where you're serious, you're going to lose weight, the cookie doesn't apply anymore. Because when your heart is fixed on losing weight, you'll lose weight. When your heart is fixed on getting something, you'll find or figure out a way to make that happen. Am I right or am I wrong? Amen. So finish some things in your life before this new year ends. Yes. Finish some things. Settle it no matter what 2020 brings. <coughs> everything is going to be all right because in your heart it's fixed already. Give him praise one more time. <laughs> so first of the year people like to change their batteries in their uh, smoke detectors, right, or at least you're supposed to once a year, uh, change filters and things like that. How many change your oil on a regular basis? <laughs> Mr. Nelson, your oil changes itself. <laughs> Senior truck. Um, we have patterns and systems in our life that we should apply. Uh, you should do you know, your doctor visits, your checkups, and things like that. But how many of us, I wonder, have a system or a plan for our spiritual walk with God? I dare say that a lot of us just, whatever happens, happens. We let it come as it comes. Not all, but some. This morning I want to talk to you a little bit about a, uh, I want to show you a picture actually that Christ painted about a spiritual checkup. And how often we should do that. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25.
seated. In chapter 25 of Matthew, Jesus tells three stories, essentially. The first one we just read about, the second one is about the talent. Those that have talent will have more if they use their talent. Those that do not have, uh, do not use their talent, it will be taken from them, and they will have nothing, and then it says they will be cast out. Uh, the third one is about the sheep and the goats. And those are the three parables or stories that he tells us about. Today we're just going to look at the first one. If we back up just a little bit, Matthew 24 tells us about the coming of the Lord. It says two will be working, one will be left, and one will be taken. Uh, it says that uh, no one knows the hour or the day. But then tucked into that, in the middle of that, he says a few things in there that should mean quite a bit to us if we hear God's word correctly. He says things like, uh, no one will know the day or the hour, but then he makes a statement, when you see these things coming, this generation that sees these things will not pass away until I return. Now he said, the ones that see these things coming to pass will not pass away until I return. Return. So it's a very open statement there. But then again, as we go back and begin to study prophecy and look at things, here's some things that we will find out. That one of the things, and you've heard me say it many times, but I'm going to say it again. On May 14, 1948, Israel declared that they were a nation after 2,000 years of being Palestine. And then uh, President Truman, I believe it was, let me look at my note to make sure, Truman, I wasn't around in 48, uh, Harry Truman, the very same day, recognized Israel as a nation. In one day, Israel became a nation. A nation that was not became a nation again in one day. That is scripture fulfilled. And the generation that saw that come to pass will not pass away until the return of Christ, or at least that's one of the things. In uh, June of 1967, Jerusalem was taken back by Israel. After the, after the six or seven day war, it depends on how you look at it. They literally took Jerusalem back as part of Israel. Another thing that had to happen before the return of Christ. These are things that had to happen. Now, I was born in 1966, so 67 is certainly my generation, right? The generation that you live in. Whether that generation is 100 years, whether it's uh, 72 years, whatever it is, this generation will not pass until the Lord returns. Now, if you want to dig into that, we'll certainly sit down at a time and dig it out and show you detail bit by bit. But, it, but it's in your scripture, not necessarily found in one verse that's written out, June 1948, but, but it's in there. So here's what he says to them when he's telling them this in chapter 24. Then in chapter 25... He says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, if you understand anything about Jewish tradition, and you should, you should study a little bit about it. You say, well, if it's not in the Bible, it is. It started in Genesis and ended in Revelation. It's throughout there because predominantly Jesus was talking to the Jewish crowd and the Gentiles that were grafted in. But he's explaining pictures to a Jewish crowd. And he says to them, uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened to ten virgins who were the bridegroom's bride, if you will. And some say it's not quite that way. Let me just explain it to you real quick. The ten virgins were ready to accept the bridegroom. Now, what he's doing is painting a picture of a Jewish wedding. How many ever seen a Jewish wedding? They're pretty amazing, first of all. It's beautiful. But here's kind of how it works. The father prepares the marriage. Okay? That's the first step is the father prepares the marriage. God the father prepared for us a bridegroom. And then the groom goes and he invites the bride to accept his proposal. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever so who is the proposal to? Every single one of us. Romans tells you that every man, woman, and child in this room was predestined with an opportunity to accept Christ. Now so 
some people get that out of whack and they say, oh, well, everybody's predestined. That means if it's God's will, you're going to be saved. If it wasn't God's will, it's not. That's not what he said. He said everyone is predestined to be the bride of the bridegroom. Every single man, woman, and child has an opportunity. He predestined them with free will to choose whether or not they accepted the invitation. Now, in a Jewish wedding, and actually if you go back to the Seder meal, there's a cup that sits there, and it literally is the cup of salvation. It is called, but here's what happens. The bridegroom offers the cup to the potential bride. You're not getting my water. <laughs> if she drinks the cup, then she accepts the marriage proposal. That would simply be salvation to us. We would accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Then, as he explains in this scripture, the groom goes away to prepare the place for the bride. How many have read that Jesus said, if I go away, I will come again? He painted a picture because he wanted them to understand what he was saying. Did you know that when a Jewish man proposes to a woman and she accepts, he goes back to build a room onto his house, or they did in that day, and a room onto the father's house. And only the father could say when the, bride, when the groom could go get the bride. The son didn't know when it was going to be prepared. All he knew was to be preparing. Scripture tells us that Jesus doesn't even know the day. Only the father knows the day and the hour that he can go get his bride. So he says to be prepared, to be prepared. So the son is given the proposal. There's ten virgins waiting on it. And it literally says that they are ready. They are waiting. <coughs> and then the bridegroom comes at an hour they knew not. And it says every single one of them were sleeping. Every one of them were sleeping. And that when the bridegroom, when they heard that the bridegroom was coming, that they woke up and they prepared. Five wise and five not so wise. Every one of these had accepted the offer. Now, I know this rattles some theologies along the way, but truth is truth from God's word. Every one of them had accepted the offer of the bridegroom, or for us that would be salvation. But some of those were ready to go when he called, and some simply were not. So he says that the ones that were not, they took a oil, their oil lamp, and they filled it with oil. Now, Miss Becca made this out of clay for me uh, because I tried to order one from Israel and could not get it here before today. I tried to get an original one. This one's just a hair bigger than a Jewish oil lamp of those days. Now, I know that some would say, well, that means torch. It's translated lampus from the word lampus. It's translated seven times in the New Testament. Six of those are lamp. Only one is torch. And if you go back and study it out, consistently, this is what they were speaking of. A lamp. Consistently throughout the Jewish tradition and scripture. So here's what it says. They took the lamp they took the lamp and they took extra oil. Now the lamp fills with oil. There's a wick that comes out here and it burns so that they can have light. Way back in the day they used fish oil, but fish oil burns too quickly. So they began to use olive oil. Olive oil is a little more expensive because of the process to get olive oil, the crushing of the olives, and all that we can get into, but we won't today. But it literally says that they took their lamp and they took oil. Because they knew that they were going to need extra oil. Now, I tried to find how long, if you ever studied one of these to see how long it burns, I tried every way from Sunday to figure out how long one of these would burn. But here's all I can tell you. In Scripture, when they lit the candles, or, or they lit uh, the, the lamp, that it had to be refueled every 24 hours, and that's the one in the altar. So I can't find for this one. If you find it, please let me know. But I figure if that's a good ratio, 24 hours, I can't imagine this lasting that long. But here's what he said. 
the ones that had oil in their lamp and more oil to put in their lamp got to go. The others did not because they were not ready. <coughs> now, I think about things like this and I'm thinking, if this thing lasts eight hours, and oil almost always represents the Holy Spirit, right? That means for me to keep my lamp burning, I need to be in contact with God the Father, the Son, and or the Holy Spirit before my lamp runs out of oil. I need to be in continuous contact with God the Father, God the Son, and or God the Holy Spirit in order to keep my lamp burning bright. And I know we live in a world, and, and I'm not going to get into this, not going to get deep into this anyway. I understand that we live in a world that says grace covers everything, and I'm thankful that it does. Because when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I became a spiritual virgin. Point on. And like the virgins, those that understand the concept that you can't just say a prayer and then you're covered from this day forward, that you have to be in constant contact, relationship, you have to constantly keep the oil in your lamp. And I know that we've been told our whole lives that Christ is returning soon. And honestly, the church has become complacent about it. Because now it's just kind of a, a throw it out there, right? But he says when you're not expecting, it's when he's coming back. Yeah. And I'm thinking, if this is the picture that he paints, that means I ought to get up and fill my oil out. That means somewhere during the day, I ought to add a little oil to my lamp. That means before I go to bed, I need to make sure that my lamp is full of oil. Because I'd hate to believe in it. And get so complacent that I missed it when he showed up. Now see, I understand that there's a line that used to say, uh, if, if you sin one time, you looked at a pretty girl at work, you're going straight to hell if you don't repent for it. And I understand there's a line that's so greasy that you can do whatever. Do you know that there is a song out right now? And I loved it when I first heard it. And then I read the lyrics. And it says, sin cannot separate me from God. I bet you've heard and listened to the song. And I'm thinking, if sin can't separate me, what can? What's the purpose of having God in my life? And we are lulled to sleep. But if we are prepared, if we are truly prepared in our heart, if the picture he paints And he says, you need to keep your lamp full and have plenty on, on resource. What do we have in common with those ten virgins? Well, first of all, we all sleep, right? But another thing is we all need oil in our lamps. We all need in constant contact with the Holy Spirit. We need to literally be filled. I believe it's Matthew 7, 22 and 23. It says, Be ye not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. And if we're not careful, we'll get to a place along the way where we get so complacent that we, well, we've got a hold of God when we were young. We're good. And when he comes, we won't be prepared. So today, I want to bring you good tidings. To say, check yourself. Check the dipstick of your spirituality. How do you do that? Well, I can tell you how to fill it up, and I can kind of tell you how to check it, if you will. Scripture says things like this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're spewing out anger, and you're spewing out frustration, and you're spewing out things that are not of God, check your level of Holy Spirit baptism. Check your level of what's inside you. Amen. Check your level because, you know, another thing that we have in common with those ten virgins, I 
can't give you my all. As much as we like to get close to people that are filled with the anointing because we like to get a little bit of their anointing on us, right? It doesn't work like that. I cannot take your anointing, your all. And although the wise one said, I can't give it to you, the truth is that. We can't give it. I can, you can't get enough oil on Sunday morning to survive a life that is ready for the bridegroom to split the eastern sky. How can I check my... How's my prayer life? How's my study life? I didn't worship out loud this morning. Kathy probably said, thank God, right? But I didn't want to lose my voice. And it's already been suffering. And it's like I was starving because I couldn't sing songs to my God. Because that's the way I worship. That's the way I present myself to him as a living sacrifice. And church, I would say nothing to harm you. But I, if I don't tell you the truth, Casual Christianity may not get you there. I would suggest, just like you check everything else in your life, you probably wake up with a routine almost every single day. I would check my spirituality as if... Do I think it's real easy to lose? Probably not, but I would say this. If I use this as the image God gave me and said, if I don't keep my lamp full of oil, if I don't have a resource to get to more oil at all times, I want my life to be to a point to where literally that I would know without a shadow of a doubt, not what someone's taught me, but in my heart, that I have enough of a connection that he won't turn me away. Tells us in 24 what's coming. In 25, he gives example after example after example of those that don't make it. And I would be ministering amiss if I didn't share with you occasionally. Be ready. Be ready. And if I can judge my being ready by that, tremble thinking about the fact that, oh Lord, I get so busy some days that I use you as a be ready. Be ready. If you don't finish anything else in your life, let your spiritual walk be ready. Don't count on someone's opinion that Maybe you'll make it, or you'll make it whatever. Have such a relationship with Christ that you know, Amen. without a doubt. How do you do that? Keep dipping in the oil. 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 Make sure that you have enough oil. Because he's coming. I don't know when. A hundred years is a generation that probably means before 19 or 2048. We can't say for sure. But what we can say is reality. Most of the people in this room will see the return of Christ. The good news is. check our oil, to check our lamps, to not be one that said a prayer so many years ago and then we're just not ready when he gets here. <coughs> that we are ready. That we are ready for the return of Christ. Why is Holy Spirit baptism so important? I know some say, well, I don't need that. Can I tell you that he's like a teleprompter that reminds me every second of every hour of every minute of every day where I need to be with him? He tells me when I'm not where I need to be. Just a sec. It's one of the most beautiful things that can 
ever happened in your life. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit baptism completely immersed and you're born again, you still have the Holy Spirit. Because you had to have him to receive Christ. He had to draw you. How often are you in touch with him? Of the ten virgins, only five were completely ready. That scares me for the body of Christ. It scares me for the body of Christ. It scares me for my children. It scares me for my church. It scares you for my, it scares me for my I got so lazy or complacent that I didn't take time to fill my old man. I love you enough today to tell you the truth. To tell you that check yourself. Check yourself. And I would recommend more than once a day if I'm looking at that old man I'm thinking I know how many times a day I put wood fire in my wood stove. some that sounds offensive today and to some that may sound too hard to others they're rejoicing that I would speak the truth but Father all I want to do is please you and if I've done that here today then I've accomplished what you had for me now I pray that your sweet Holy Spirit would visit everyone in this room what needs to be stirred.